Hey, boaters, it's Jim from Ray Marine. It's Thursday night, and that means it's time for Ray Marine Live. Thank you all for coming out and joining us tonight on Facebook and YouTube. Whether you're here for the live broadcast right now or you're watching this as a replay later on, remember that you can always leave your questions and comments in the stream, whether on Facebook or YouTube. We try to take as many questions as we can here live during the stream, and we'll follow up on all of them afterwards as well. We want to make sure everybody gets their questions answered, so feel free to drop them in anytime. So tonight, we are going to be talking about the all-new Lighthouse Charts by Ray Marine. Uh, we have started rolling out charts over the last couple of months, and this past week we launched Lighthouse Charts for North America. So everybody in the U.S. and Canada has been eagerly awaiting the arrival of these charts. We'll show you some of their key features tonight, show you some cool things that they can do, and uh, give you a glimpse of uh, how they work on a live Axiom system. Before we get into Lighthouse Charts, I want to just talk for a second about Lighthouse 3.14 Fremantle. Uh, as you know, we name our Lighthouse releases after prominent boating destinations. And as I mentioned last week, Fremantle is in Western Australia. I know we have a pretty big contingent of Australian viewers on the broadcast every week. It's uh, early in, on Friday morning there, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, Lighthouse 314 Fremantle is available now on raymarine.com for download or you can get it directly through your Axiom Lighthouse 3 MFD. And let me show you how to do that real quick. Uh, Mr. Producer Man, can you switch over to the product camera, please? And actually go to the other one. My fault, gave you the wrong one. And I'm gonna bring this Axiom up to its home screen. And uh, don't be concerned here, I have done some reconfiguring of this for tonight's broadcast. You'll see a lot of chart windows programmed up, but this is a normal Axiom home screen, just minus a lot of the normal icons that you would normally see. Uh, but to do a software update on your system, this is a, an over-the-air software update. So you'll need to have access to the internet using Wi-Fi from your MFD. You can come right in here to the settings menu on the bottom, and you'll notice uh, I have a button right here, update software. And when I touch it, uh, what it actually is going to do is it ask if I want to look from a, a card that I pre-downloaded or check online, I am going to check online. If I needed to configure my Wi-Fi network and connect, I could do that right now with my Wi-Fi settings. I would choose uh, the network I want to connect to, enter my password, but I have already done that. I am connected up to our office network here, so I'm just going to say start. And what the system does is it connects over the internet to Raymarine servers. It's going to check not only my multifunction display, but all of my accessories that are connected as well. So you can see here, it has determined I have two MFDs on my network. I have an Axiom 12 RV and an Axiom Plus 12 uh, RV. Uh, so I've got two of them here side by side linked together. Now, if my software was out of date, it would automatically check the boxes um, next to these MFDs. Uh, but since these ones have actually already been updated, it's telling me I don't really need to take any software. But if I selected one of them, for example, if I touch the Axiom 12, it'll actually prompt and say, do you really want to reinstall the current software? Um, and 314.88 is the latest public release. So if I wanted to proceed with an update, I could just say yes. It'll pull the software down uh, and it'll load it up. If you had other peripherals, if you've got radar, if you've got sonar, if you've got an autopilot, if any of those things are out of date, it will pull down updates for those. Now, if you have not yet updated to Lighthouse 314 Fremantle, uh, you will see when you download it, there are some mandatory updates for sonar modules. So if you are running a Raymarine CP100, a 200, a 370, a 470, a 570, an RVX 1000, um, or you're running any of our little keypads, an RMK9 or an RMK10, there is going to be a software update for all of those items that comes along with Lighthouse 314 Fremantle. So you'll see them in this list of available updates. The boxes should be checked by default for you. Um, and when you hit the button to update all of those selected items, it'll pull down software for those as well. Uh, plan on it taking probably about 10 to 15 minutes to update uh, all of your gear. So you wanna make sure you have a nice stable Wi-Fi connection, make sure your boat's already on. 
uh, so your batteries aren't going to conk out on you or anything like that uh, mid-process. If something does go wrong, you can just restart it, uh, but factor in about 15 minutes of time to complete that update. Uh, very, very easy to do. Once you get it started, it's largely hands-off. The, the MFD will take care of upgrading all the peripherals. So we'll cancel out of here. So that Lighthouse 314 Fremantle has um, a lot of supporting features for Lighthouse Charts North America in it. So if you want to run these new charts, you will want to have that uh, on your system. And again, make sure you take the, uh, the sonar updates that it offers as well, because you do need those to keep your peripherals connected. So let's take a look at the charts themselves. This is the Lighthouse North America chart. We're actually looking at outer Boston Harbor here. I have a route plotted. Our boat is headed inbound. So the first thing I want you to notice are the, um, the color palettes that we have selected for Lighthouse charts. Uh, we have tried to go with a color scheme that is very, very easy to read, provides good contrast between the deep water and the shallows, good contrast between the shallows and the land. Um, we're using some unique color shading for the mud areas, um, all to just kind of increase your situational awareness, make it easier at a glance to see where the boat is on the chart. Now, some neat things that we can do, we can adjust the size of all of the chart icons. So when we're looking at things like our uh, buoys, our nav aids, um, we can adjust all that. And the way that we do it is right in here. So I'm gonna use my mouse so you'll be able to see the mo motions. I go into my menu, I go down here to the bottom and into the settings, the settings of this gear icon on the bottom. And these are going to be on the layers tab. And on the layers tab, I have this thing here called chart object size. And if I slide this to the right, it is going to make all of the navigation aids larger. Let me give it a moment here just to refresh. I have this one kind of running on overdrive. I've got a lot of charts stuffed into this machine for tonight. There we go. There's an example of the charts. Uh, the chart icons at their maximum size. I'm just going to close out here so you can see it on the full presentation. So that brings your buoys, your nav aids, the lighthouses, um, any of the points of information icons uh, up to whatever size you like. What's kind of cool about it on lighthouse charts is those are infinitely adjustable. So you can go, you know, as large as you want up to the size I have here. Um, there are, you can also go in the other direction and make them much, much smaller. Uh, and it's a sliding scale. You can go anywhere in between. Uh, so highly customizable. You can get the icons just uh, to what you like. Um, I'm going to move the chart inland a little bit here. So let me drag it. And we're going to head in towards the inner harbor in Boston. And I want to talk a little bit about the points of interest information that you'll find in Lighthouse Charts. So we have um, several providers that we're working with for our POI data. Um, the first is a company called Mapbox. Uh, now, Mapbox is a provider of data to lots of different uh, geographical mobile applications. So if you're running street mapping, if you're running business location, if you're doing automotive navigation, if you're doing backcountry navigation, Mapbox provides all sorts of mapping solutions and uh, maps, points of interest, and all the, the kind of backend data you need to make that happen. So Mapbox is a partner on Lighthouse Charts, and you'll see their data particularly reflected in the land side detail. So you can see in this uh, overview of Boston, we actually have streets included on here. Now you might say, well, why do I need all these, all these streets uh, when I'm driving around in my boat? Well, they do give you an idea of what services are available and just how far uh, from the water they are. So as we zoom in, you'll actually start to see restaurants, you'll see hotels, you'll see barbershops uh, and all sorts of other things that you might need if you're visiting a port uh, for the first time. Let me zoom up here just a little bit. There we go. You can see we've got, we've got pizza, we've got Mexican, we've got a hotel catering and pies, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, so all of that data that we're looking at there is part of our Mapbox uh, premium uh, POI. So there's another set of icons that you're gonna notice along the shoreline. And these ones here are from marinas.com. So marinas.com is a provider of nautical data, uh, primarily specializing in obviously marinas and boating related services. 
So all of these uh, larger colorized icons are all marinas.com content. And we can uh, click on any of them with a long press, uh, and it will give us uh, some information about what we are looking at at that spot. So in this case, we've got a marina, the Boston Shipyard Marina, and I can touch on it and get all the details. This is actually their listing uh, from uh, marinas.com. Uh, so we have pretty extensive level of information in here uh, for marinas, boat ramps, uh, gas docks, uh, boating supplies, all, all the kind of stuff you might uh, need to reference uh, if you're in unfamiliar waters with your boat. Another aspect of the Metbox premium data, we're going to zoom in just a little bit here on downtown Boston. Zoom in a little more. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, as we zoom in, in addition to the streets and the POIs, you will also start to see the foundations and layouts for uh, buildings. Uh, so in a big city, obviously, you're going to need some prominent landmarks sometimes as you're navigating in. Uh, you'll see that information here as well when you get to the right range scale. We'll start to see the building foundations populate here momentarily. Any moment. Maybe. Maybe. We'll let that sit for a second. I think it's still loading up some POI information. Uh, but anyway, there are building foundations in there as well. And on top of that, it are high resolution satellite photos. So let me show you how to get to the satellite photos that works very similar to uh, if you're running Navionics or running CMAP, uh, we can bring up satellite photos as a layer. So I open my menu, I come down here again to my settings, I go to my layers, and I'm gonna scroll down here just a little bit and I'm gonna go to aerial. And when I turn on my aerial overlay, I will get a layer of satellite photos and I'll exit just so you guys can see them all in full screen presentation. So you can see they are high res, they are very detailed. Um, as we zoom in, we will get even more uh, resolution uh, out of these photos. Um, so you can get a very, very good idea of what is up there on the beach in any given area. Um, you do have the option of trimming the satellite photos so they only show up over the land, leaving the water fully exposed, or uh, you can um, uh, show the entire satellite photo. So if there are areas where there might be shallows or flats or something that you can see just under the surface of the water that was captured in the satellite image, um, we can see that uh, as well. If you want to enable that or change that setting, again, go into the menu. Go down here to the settings. You'll see we're taking this path quite often. And this is an advanced option. So we're gonna go over to the advanced tab. And as we scroll down here, you'll see all sorts of different chart related things. And in our chart appearance, oops, I think I just went past it. Once again, chart appearance, aerial overlay. I'm gonna to go to land and sea. And you'll see it refresh. And now it has filled in uh, the water area here. And just to give you the bigger view of it, we will zoom out. In case any of you are wondering how we are doing this, this is the AnyDesk app. I actually have a PC linked to this Axiom using AnyDesk remote desktop software. That is a standard part of the Raymarine apps loadout you'll find uh, in that apps menu off of your home screen. Uh, so it's great for doing demonstrations like this. So here's all, all sorts of Mapbox premium information. Um, you can see we've got tons of restaurants. We've got the marinas.com information along the shoreline. Uh, so a whole, uh, you know, encyclopedia of information um, all along the shoreline there, everything you might want to see. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually turn my aerial overlay off for a moment because I want to show you uh, something that we have done on the system related to color palettes. Now, we rolled out color palettes um, a while ago, but it wasn't until Lighthouse Charts came along that we could take full advantage of this uh, capability. So I'm just going to turn off um, a couple of layers here. Uh, I'm going to turn off the uh, aerial, we'll turn off that field of view indicator because we're not using it. And I'm going to close and go back out to the main map. And let's uh, let's do a fine ship. 
And looks like we're in the outer harbor. Let's zoom out just a little bit so we can get a better view here. All right, so um, if I want to change uh, my color palettes, uh, I can do so very easily. And I might want to do that because the time of day uh, I am boating uh, changes and the lighting conditions change. So this is kind of the normal uh, daytime color palette for Lighthouse Charts. Um, what I want to show you, uh, Mr. Producer Man, can you bring up the alternate product camera so that they can see uh, my MFD? There we go. So down uh, in the corner here on this Axiom, I have my swipe uh, power control. Uh, I can't show you this through any desk, so that's why I had you bring it up this way. Uh, when I swipe this, I get my uh, kind of quick shortcut menu uh, that pops up here. And you'll see it's down here, display mode. So I'm going to touch display mode. And, oops, I timed out on me. Display mode. I'm going to go into nighttime mode. So what is going to happen is this display is going to shift into its nighttime color palette. And you'll see not only does the display change, but in a moment, the Lighthouse Charts will also render into their nighttime color palette. Uh, so now I could even go a few steps further. I could dim the backlight if I wanted to and go really, really low. Uh, but I can certainly optimize it for nighttime navigation. Now let's say, for example, uh, I am out on a moonless night uh, out in open water and there is no other lighting and I want to go even darker. Uh, we support that as well. I can swipe display mode and I can choose extra dark. When I go to extra dark, it's going to remove even more uh, bright objects from the display, uh, take it down even just to a lower level uh, for ultimate, you know, super dark uh, night vision capability. There is another scenario uh, in here as well. Um, so I'm going to bring this back to daytime mode. Let's go to day. We will let it re-render. Um, there are times when the daytime palette might not offer quite enough contrast to your eyes. Um, so in those occasions, we actually have what we call a super day or a bright day uh, color palette. Um, and that is um, kind of a system level setting that you can select from the outset. So what we find that most customers that have played with these, they choose either the standard day or the bright day and they leave it that way all the time. So the bright day color palette selector is in a slightly different location. Let me show you where that is. I'm gonna come into the menu, again down in here to settings. I am gonna to go to layers and right here I can default the daytime color palette always to the bright sun. And I'm going to close this out so that you can see it change. And you'll see that in, rather than using uh, traditional blues and browns, we're going to go to more of a teal uh, color. We're going to go to more of a lime green on the mud areas. And this just improves the, uh, the color and contrast during the day in those bright sunshine conditions. A little bit more of a yellowy orange to the landmass. Uh, so you'll find in bright sun, this really, really pops. It also, I find it works really well with sunglasses uh, as well. And almost everybody's going to have sunglasses on their face when they're boating. Um, I, I'm personally a huge fan of this bright uh, color palette. So I, I leave mine uh, all the time in this uh, bright mode. So let's pause for a second. Let's take a look at some questions. I see a whole bunch of them have come in since we started. Uh, what do you got for me, Mr. Producer Man? Richard would like to know, where is the best place to learn Element for beginners? Just got one. All right, Richard. So Element is a slightly different product than what we're working with tonight, but it is similar in many regards. Uh, so some of the things you'll see in this broadcast are a good starting point. Uh, but that said, we are planning to have uh, an Element-specific uh, Raymarine Live coming up in the next couple of weeks. So definitely be sure to subscribe uh, to our channel on YouTube. I see you're a YouTube viewer. If you subscribe to the Raymarine YouTube channel, you'll get notified uh, about every Raymarine Live broadcast and in particular about that element one that we have coming up. Paul would like to know, mine won't connect to the internet. Tried several. Uh, let me show you where we do that, Paul. So you're going to go to the home screen. 
we are going to go in here to the apps menu because a lot of these apps are internet dependent. So we stuck the internet connectivity button up in here. Uh, this button is where I can choose um, what network I want to connect to. So I'll touch the button. And you can see here in our office, we have tons of different Wi-Fi devices all over the place. Uh, but if you imagine you're in your marina or maybe you're uh, at a dock behind your home, uh, you would just look for the Wi-Fi connection point that you want to connect to. Um, and then once you touch it, uh, you would be prompted to enter your password. Uh, you type it in on the on-screen keyboard and press connect. Um, the profiles that we support are pretty standard. You should be able to connect to most uh, residential, household, and a lot of marina Wi-Fi systems. Uh, the only ones that'll give you trouble, uh, I know for sure, is if there is a Wi-Fi system that requires you to log in on a web page and enter a password or something like that. Uh, we're not able to connect to those currently, though that is something that we are working on. Um, but anything that uses a traditional access point where you uh, pick the SSID, type in the password, should be able to connect right up to that. Uh, so if you're having continuing problems with that, definitely give our support line a shout and uh, we can help you out. I'm just going to close out of here so I don't lose my internet connection for, for everything else we're doing. In fact, oh, I did. I closed the uh, AnyDesk out. Well, here's a, here's a good lesson. Uh, we weren't planning this for tonight, but let me show you how this works. Um, so these are the Lighthouse apps that are installed on my uh, Raymarine system. And here is AnyDesk. AnyDesk is remote desktop software. Some of you may have used it at work or other places. So what I did here is I opened AnyDesk. And then on my other PC that is being shared, um, you can actually show them if you want, Mr. Producer. If you go over to the other product camera, there we go. Um, I am going to connect to my MFD, which is uh, at this remote desktop address. I just hit the connect button. And through the magical powers of the internet, back over here on my MFD, it's asking me if I want to allow this uh, remote connection. I'm going to say start. And I'm going to accept. And voila, there is my MFD back again. And you can all see it again as well. So now it's actually just mirroring through any desk. Uh, it is a great tool that allows you to log in remotely to the MFD and control it. So you can use it for training. You can use it for troubleshooting, things like that. Um, let's go back to the chart. All right. So we talked a little bit about some of the basics of Lighthouse charts. Um, let's look at some other uh, options that it has that are kind of neat. Um, we have the notion in Axiom of chart operating modes. So when I open a menu on Axiom, and uh, let me bring you back to full screen just so you can see this a little bit better. There we go. When I open the menu, the chart menu here, you'll see these kind of quick action buttons. Um, you'll see this kind of user interface, not only in the chart, you'll see it in the sonar and in the radar. So the chart has operating modes as well. So we are in detailed mode, which provides us uh, maximum chart detail for navigation. Um, we do have a simplified mode as well. So if you want to instantly declutter the chart and just get down to the most basic chart elements, you just touch uh, simplified mode and you'll see the chart update. It will actually strip away uh, some of its layers. In this case, it's taking away some of the depths, but it does leave the contours behind. Um, and let me zoom out just a little bit so you can see the bigger picture overall. Again, you get your major navigation aids. Uh, we get the colorizations uh, for the depths. So we get the land mass. But overall, it is a much, much clearer uh, view. So if you uh, need to just declutter rapidly to take a look at where you are, look at what's around you, um, with the touch of a button, you can go to simple. And then when you need to bring everything back, just open the menu, go back to detailed mode, and you'll see the chart refresh and bring back all of its elements. And they will load up here. Another thing you could see, um, well, it was in simplified mode and now again back in detailed mode, um, these charts also have tides and currents uh, in them. So we're actually seeing some current stations uh, right here. You can actually touch on any of these. Um, go to the, our chart info, and we have title information that we can bring up. I can just click on it, and it should load up. In this case, uh, this is a current speed station, so I can get the speed of the current at that location. 
Uh, there's tied information uh, in here as well. It also plugs in uh, sunrise, sunset. Um, you can see the direction of flow. And of course, you can uh, jump ahead in time as well. So if you want to look uh, forwards or backwards, you can just simply uh, click in you know, whatever date uh, you want to see. We could go to uh, today's date, May 20th, 2021. And voila, here is all the data for this point in Boston as of today. Uh, we're running a data simulator, so it actually thinks it's a few months ago. Uh, but there we go. There's today uh, in Boston. Normally that comes from your, your GPS clock. So it always starts with the current day. So that is a tide station, or sorry, a current station. And there are tide stations in here as well. Um, another thing that Lighthouse Charts offers you is actually two charts in one. So the presentation that we're looking at here is what we call a leisure chart. I think that is a word that has come out of uh, our team in the UK. Uh, here we might call it a recreational chart, but this is a leisure view of our charting. We also have in Lighthouse Charts the government chart view, which is a very no frills, bare bones, all you need to navigate, but nothing more view of the chart. And it's another way that you can kind of declutter the system, uh, get rid of the streets, get rid of the POIs, get rid of the satellite overlays, and just see the basic navigation data. Um, we can change views in the chart menu. Again, so I go to menu. I come down here into my settings, my layers. And right here I have chart style. Let's see if this is going to agree with me in any desk. Can I move you down? I have leisure. Oops, and I have government. I went too far. Let me go back up here. This is the leisure tab. This is the government tab. So let's change from leisure view to government view. Touch. There we go. And if we watch in the little preview window here, we will see it transition. There we go. And let's go out to the big, the big chart so you can see it up close. So in government view, it goes to a standard um, vector chart color palette. It uses now the standard NOAA navigational symbology. Um, the depth readings, the spot soundings all conform to the standard uh, government chart uh, layouts. So you can see it is a much more simplified view. Uh, it loses kind of all of that value added information, if you will. So all the restaurants are gone, the boat docks are gone, the, the pump out stations, all that sort of stuff. Um, but it gives you all the critical elements for navigation right there in the government view. Uh, let's pause again and let's uh, take a look at a few more questions. Ben would like to know, do the Lighthouse Charts yet support Mexico, at least down to Ensenada? I'm in San Diego, and that's where we run a lot. Uh, you know what, Ben? Let's take a look. I don't think we go down there quite yet, but it is part of our master plan to eventually rule the world. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm bringing up on this Axiom a full screen presentation to show you the boundaries of the Lighthouse Chart North America. Uh, chipset. So this basically covers Canada, uh, the United States, and the Western uh, Bahamas. Uh, so it does not yet go down to Mexico. They'll um, watch for that in a future release. Uh, but this is the, uh, the covered area. It is uh, not only coastal charts, it is inland charts as well. So if there are major lakes, rivers, estuaries in here that are boatable, uh, there are charts for those uh, as well, all, all built in. What else do we have for questions in there? Jim Bandy would like to know, is it possible to change the shading areas to shallow for, uh, I'm sorry, is it possible to change the shading so areas too shallow for the boat turn red? Um, not, we can't turn them red, Jim, but we can actually adjust the colorized shading. Let me uh, change views on here and show you how we can uh, have some control over the shallows. Um, so we're going to come back in here to Boston Harbor. And let me first get it out of the government view that we left it in. I'm going to go into my menu. I am going to go to my layers. Let's go back to a recreational or leisure view. There we 
one second for the chart to redraw. Um, so we have uh, basically three colors of depth contour on the chart. So you have white, which indicates your deepest water. Uh, you have light blue, which is kind of an intermediate range. And then you have blue, which is the shallow water. So we don't have the ability to turn the, the shallowest water blue, uh, red, sorry, but we can uh, keep it in the dark blue color and you can set where that comes in. Uh, so where we do that is in the menu. I go to menu. I am going to go into my settings again. Uh, this time I'm going to go over to the depths tab. And if I scroll down here just a little bit, I have shallow contour. I have safe contour. Oops, I did it again. Let's go back up. There we go. Shallow contour. I have safe contour and I have deep contour areas. So the shallow contour is anything that is in the dark blue, like the navy blue uh, color. So this would be the water that you want to stay out of uh, at all costs. So I could set this lower, for example. So I could go to uh, five feet. Actually, let's go the other way with this. Let's make this higher um, because I think you're going to see a more dramatic change uh, going in that direction. Now, the thing about these three uh, contour levels is they do have to be numerically sequential. That is, the shallow contour has to be less than, or than the safe contour, which has to be less than the deep contour in order for all this to work uh, correctly. Uh, let's pull this in just a little bit. We also need to be at a range scale where we can actually see the colorization. We're a little bit far out. So right now, anything over 20 feet deep is in white. So let's start with this one. Let's take this setting here and let's reduce it. So I'm going to make my deep contour now 10 feet. So anything, you know what, let's go the other way. Okay, so by making my deep contour greater, now anything that is 35 feet or now 40 feet or greater is going to be white. So there we go. Now that intermediate level is starting to expand. So this is my, what we call the deep area. This is the safe area. So safe is basically everything between 15 and 45 feet now. If I wanted to make the shallow area even bigger, I can do that. So right now, everything in the shallows is out to 11 feet. Uh, let's go up to 15 feet. So it won't let me go any higher than 15 because the safe is already at 15 feet. So you can see how it adjusts the colorization for us. It starts to fill in additional areas that we might want to avoid. So keep in mind, the shallow contour is what you want to avoid. The safe contour is, think of it as like advisory. Uh, and then the deep contour is go anywhere you want. Um, you can set these up to match the draft of your boat. Probably give yourself you know, a little bit of safety margin uh, in that shallow contour. What else we got for questions up there, Mr. Producer? Let's try one more. Moxie, how do they compare to Navionics charts? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, as far as the data is concerned, um, we source our data from the official uh, hydrographic offices around the world. So in the United States, that data comes from uh, NOAA, um, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, so that is the source of the base level data. But we also have private sources of data as well. Um, the charts are updated very regularly. Um, in fact, um, they get updated uh, multiple times per month. And uh, I'll show you that in a second, how you can actually update your charts. So we are getting fresh uh, data, fresh updates all the time, uh, not only to the charts, but also to the POI uh, information and the satellite information. So from uh, a, an accuracy standpoint, uh, I think you will find they are uh, extremely comparable to the competition. Uh, feature for feature, um, they're, they're pretty good. They're pretty close. Um, you've got um, everything you need for navigation. Uh, there is fishing data uh, built in here as well. There's some bathymetric data that we'll show you in, in a second. Um, so overall, it's a nice package. The satellite photos, um, enhanced POIs, um, and uh, there is um, 
the means to uh, update the charts on a regular basis as well. So they're definitely worth a look. Um, let's see, we got another question in there. Mark would like to know, he also tried to load 314, but told there was insufficient memory on the card. So Mark, uh, you probably have a first generation Axiom unit. Um, the difference between a first gen Axiom and an Axiom Plus is the amount of onboard storage memory. So your Axiom has eight gigabytes of memory. Um, an Axiom Plus has 16 gigabytes of internal memory. Um, and what the system is basically telling you is there's not quite enough room for it to download the update file and store it temporarily uh, to do the update. Uh, the easy solution to that is to just pop a micro SD card that is blank or that you know has at least, uh, least, have at least three gigabytes of free space uh, to pull down that 314 update file. That'll give it plenty of room uh, to hold the files it needs. Uh, it'll update your system uh, and then you can pop your map card back in. Uh, but right now, um, it would try to put it on your uh, internal memory card. There's just not enough space. David would like to know, he has a Raymarine E-Series MFD and the Lighthouse charts that it came with. Can I use the new Lighthouse 3 charts or must I have an Axiom MFD? What are the most recent Lighthouse charts for E-Series? Okay. So uh, a couple of different questions in here. So the Lighthouse charts that we are looking at tonight, this latest generation, they do need to run on Axiom uh, hardware. Uh, they won't run on the Lighthouse 2 platform, which is what I believe that you have, uh, David. Uh, so the most recent version of Lighthouse charts uh, that would run on your system would be the Lighthouse NC2 charts. Um, but uh, the ones we are looking at tonight won't run on your uh, E-Series hardware. And let's see if we got one more. Will this work on an A128? Uh, Ernest, unfortunately, it will not. Uh, so you're in a similar uh, boat uh, to the, the question we just looked at. Uh, so your A128 runs our Lighthouse 2 operating system. Uh, this generation of Lighthouse charts will not run on your plotter. I'm sorry. Um, let's take a look. Oh, one more question. Johnny Cake, and then we'll pop on to the next section. Johnny Cake, what is the subscription pricing for these charts and the premium option? All right. So the basic chart is $149. Um, it comes on a micro SD card. Um, and in the kit with it, there will be a voucher code that you can take online. And you would go to chartstore.raymarine.com, uh, enter your voucher code, and that will activate the premium uh, content uh, on your chart. Um, the premium content consists of the map box, uh, street and POI information, uh, the marinas.com uh, information, the satellite photos. Um, and if you are in Europe, uh, rather than marinas.com, we use Reed's Nautical Almanac for the data providers there. Um, so, but all of, all of that premium content comes uh, through that premium subscription. The first year of the subscription is included uh, with your purchase of the charts. Uh, after that, it is $49 a year to maintain that premium uh, level. That gives you access to all that information, all your chart updates as well. Um, so this is actually probably a good transition to the chart store. If you could bring that up for me. Let's take a look at the chart store. So this is chartstore.raymarine.com. This is running on my web browser on my laptop. And this is how you get your premium content. So when you uh, log into Chartstar for the first time, you will uh, create an account. And then anytime you come back, you just log in with your username and password. And we are in the My Charts menu. And what this shows me is whatever charts I have purchased uh, for use on my system. Um, and you can have uh, multiple charts, multiple regions going. You can also have multiple copies of the same chart. So if you have two boats, three boats, and they each need their own chart cards, um, you can have uh, multiple uh, instances of the same card. So looking down my list of charts that I uh, have purchased, I have Great Britain and Ireland. I have North America. I have a second copy of North America. Um, I have France and I have Italy. So the first thing you'll notice is um, I have updates available. So my card for France, we have published new data. If I wanted to look and see what is available, I just pop it open. And on May 18th of 2021, we had new charts, new points of interest, and new aerial photos available. 
So if I wanted to download new data for my French chart, I'd literally just hit the green button here, get the latest data. It'll pull it down to my PC and then I transfer it over to my micro SD card. Uh, same thing for Italy. I've got some stuff available here. Uh, earlier today, I was uh, setting up a new Lighthouse chart. Um, so I um, told it the areas that I wanted and it's notifying me that my file is actually ready to download. Uh, these chart files uh, can be quite large, especially in North America. It's a very, very big area. Uh, the base map uh, in North America is uh, in the neighborhood of nine gigabytes of data to pull it down. And then on top of that, you have uh, any satellite photos or other premium areas that you have uh, selected. Um, you can see this is ready to download, so I could pull it down here to my PC and then transfer it to my card. Um, I want to show you how we actually select uh, premium data. So I have my Great Britain and Ireland card actually plugged in to a card reader on my laptop. I am going to open it up here. And you can see um, Great Britain is a, a much smaller place than, the, than North America. So the base chart is one gigabyte in size. And then I have added about another uh, 900 megabytes of, um, of data uh, for point of interest and aerial photos. So what is kind of neat about Lighthouse Charts is you are not forced to take areas that you don't want or are not going to use. So you can kind of plan your data out, plan your route out, and say, yeah, I really want premium streets and points of interest here, but I don't really care about it somewhere else. Um, so you can ignore those areas. So the way that we select the premium data that we want to load is we can come in here to a category. So for streets and point of interest, I hit the green button. And it's going to render out for me some areas of uh, the chart. And let's say, for example, I know that I do a lot of boating in uh, southern England. So I want to take this area between Falmouth and Salcombe. Uh, I literally come up here. Uh, click the button, and that will enable me to drag out an area that I want. And voila, uh, that is now added uh, to my, um, my download queue. Uh, so it's about 278 megabytes to take all of the information here. Um, if I want to go to a different area uh, and grab some more, maybe uh, I was planning a cross-channel excursion over here to Jersey, I can add another area and say, yep, yeah, let's just take the whole island and I add it to the queue. So now I'm up to 300 uh, megabytes of POI data. And when I have all the areas that I want, I just say done. And maybe I want to go in and get some aerial photos as well. So I do the same thing. I just touch aerial photos. Uh, here's some areas that I was using previously. But you know what? I don't need these anymore. I can just say clear and blow those out. And maybe I want to get, well, let's get the corresponding photos. So let's go over here to Jersey. I am going to select an area, drag it out, and I'm going to take all of the high-res satellite photos for that area. And now it recalculates my download. And when I'm ready to go, I just hit the green button here and off and running. What it's going to do first is it's going to ask me where I want to put this information. I, am, I have my card plugged in, so it is going to go, in this case, to my... G drive, and I'm browsing to this Lighthouse ID file. This is a uh, file that identifies this as a Lighthouse chart. It double checks that I have the correct SD card, and I'm going to say continue. And now in the background, it's going to compile the chart information that I requested, um, and then it'll begin downloading it. So that is a, an automatic process. When it finishes, then I just take the file that it downloaded, drag it onto my SD card, and I am ready to go. Another thing that's kind of neat about Lighthouse Charts is you can have more than one region on the same SD card. Um, here in North America, you probably won't see a lot of that because it's one massive file that covers the East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf Coast, Canada, and Bahamas all on one. Uh, but over in Europe, uh, the regions are actually smaller, and that's because um, all of those uh, charts are managed by different hydrographic offices different countries, and they all want their uh, their own little bit of uh, money uh, for charts. So we have to manage them differently. Um, when you buy charts in Europe on the Lighthouse charts, uh, generally you get a voucher that's good for any two countries. Because we know a lot of you are going to be crossing borders and boating in waters for 
multiple adjacent countries. Um, so you can actually pick uh, two regions uh, and they can live on the same card. In fact, I think you can have up to five uh, adjacent regions on the same SD card. So it's pretty flexible that way. Um, another thing that you'll see down the road um, will have the ability to move some of those maps into your Axioms onboard memory. So that was the reason uh, that the Axioms actually got that storage memory upgrade is eventually they're going to be able to move some of these charts into your Axioms so you don't even have to mess with the SD cards. So watch for that in a future software update. Uh, Mr. Producer Man, what do we got for questions? Jim Baker just installed an Axiom 7 DV parked at the dock and COG is rolling 0 through 360 over and over. Will update cure that or is it another problem? Actually, Jim, what you're seeing there is fairly uh, normal. So um, any GPS system, when it is stationary, um, can very, very highly, uh, with high accuracy, calculate your position but it does not know which way you are pointed. Um, there is some natural variation in GPS. So even when the position is calculated on this spot, it drifts around even within a one by one foot square. So every time it recalculates and it says, eh, we're a little over here, we're a little over here, we're a little over here, that motion is what you're seeing translated into the boat symbol spinning round and round. Um, the cure for that actually is to add a heading sensor to your system. So what that will do, that heading sensor, uh, heading sensor will provide a constant reference for which way the boat is pointed, um, and the GPS will provide the constant reference for where the boat is positioned, and they will work together, um, and that'll actually stop that, uh, that extra motion. Um, if you are interested in an autopilot, um, an autopilot heading sensor would take care of that for you. Uh, if you have seen our augmented reality system and have any interest in that, the AR200 augmented reality uh, sensor module has a compass built in it as well um, that would also take care of that uh, extra motion that you're seeing. Adding that sensor does some other really cool things for you too. I don't know what other devices you have on your boat, but if you have radar, um, by adding the heading sensor, you get a stabilized radar display. Um, by adding the heading sensor, it enables your uh, MFD to do things like calculate set and drift automatically uh, for you. So the more information we can feed it, uh, the more uh, the more it can do for us. So definitely something to consider, Jim. But what you're seeing there right now is fairly normal. Um, one other thing that you could adjust if it really is driving you crazy, um, there is a setting uh, in the GPS setup. Actually, let's go back to the uh, the product cam, Mr. Producer. Either one, either the studio cam or the any desk feed will work. Um, I am going to go back to the home screen on this Axiom. And a lot of people don't realize it, but you can touch up here on the live GPS position. Uh, we come in here to our satellites menu. And this would tell us normally what satellites are in track at any given time. I am running a simulator right now, so I don't have any satellites in track. But normally, you'd see them plotted out here on this, uh, uh, this uh, graph. But if I come over here to the settings menu, Jim, this is what I wanted to point you to. Uh, this is a COG and SOG filter. COG is course over ground. Uh, SOG is speed over ground. And course over ground is the value that is changing that's causing that oscillation that you're seeing on your display. Uh, you could try bumping the COG SOG filter from medium, which is its default setting, uh, up to high. Um, and what that is going to do is it's going to require a little bit more motion or a little bit more variation in the GPS position uh, before it registers a change. Uh, so you could do that. It might take care of the issue. But ultimately, the heading sensor is where you want to go. And there's a lot of extra benefits to adding that to the boat. What else do we have for questions in the queue here? Gerald. When following a route and the GPS drops out, shouldn't the program destination continue when the GPS comes back up? 12 inch row. Well, um, we've got kind of two things to consider here. So number one, we should figure out why your GPS is dropping out because it really shouldn't do that. Um, the GPS receivers on an Axiom Pro are pretty sensitive. Um, they are built into the front of the display. They're actually uh, behind the glass, almost right behind the Raymarine logo. 
Um, so ideally, your Axiom Pro should have a fairly clear view of the sky so it can see the majority of the horizon around it. I suspect yours might not. Uh, so you might get on certain headings or maybe somebody is literally standing in the wrong place in front of it. They're blocking part of the sky and they're dropping out some of those satellites. Uh, and that might be what's causing the, um, the drop and fix. So if this is happening very often for you, Gerald, you may want to consider adding um, an external GPS sensor to your setup uh, to improve your reception. Um, the sensor behind the glass is great in many cases, but it just might not be perfect for yours. Um, so to the second half of the question, when the GPS drops out, um, the system is programmed to drop the track. Um, it does that kind of as a safety measure, um, but you should get alarms when the GPS fix drops uh, as well. You should be getting an audible alarm. You should be getting a visual alarm on the display. Um, so that is something it is designed to do if the GPS drops out. Uh, we do want the tracking uh, to stop. Um, and we want you to take notice of the fact that the GPS dropped out and then address the issue and then bring the system back up and online. Um, but definitely we want to get to the root cause of why your GPS is dropping out. And if you have trouble with that, Gerald, feel free to drop a PM in there with contact info and uh, we can uh, have our tech team reach out. Chai City Yacker, you've got some great content. I see your stuff go up on YouTube and thank you for sharing it with us and the Raymarine community. So his question here, will Lighthouse charts support color-coded depth shading on Axiom similar to Lake Master and CMAP for the respective brand fish finders? Desperately want this feature for fishing. Uh, so right now, uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, but I will say stay tuned uh, on this channel because uh, that is something that we know there is a big demand for out there. Um, there's a lot of different things we can do with color coding on the system, uh, not only for depth shading, but we can do things with water temperature and air temperature, and they all have um, very valuable insights for fishing. Uh, so we, uh, we definitely hear your question. We're hearing those requests and our team has taken a look to see what we can do to bring those into all of our Raymarine family of products. Mike, is there sailing features? Uh, yes, sir. So um, there are some sailing specific features built into every Axiom Lighthouse 3 system. And um, Mr. Producer Man, I wanna bring up one of the product cameras again. I'll show you, Mike, how you can access those. Uh, so this Axiom here, our studio unit, uh, I'm going to go back out to the home screen. I'm going to go into my settings. Oops, there we go. Sorry, I have two monitors here and my mouse ended up on the other monitor. So in the settings, I'm going to go up here to boat details. And when you run Axiom for the very first time out of the box, there is a startup wizard that asks you some questions. And the first thing it asks you is what kind of boat do you have? So if you go in and choose any of the sailing boats, so let's go with a cruising sailboat, um, that loads a different profile of features into Axiom than if I went in and chose a power boat or a fishing boat or a first responder uh, application. So by choosing that I am a sailboat, um, I will now have access to a lot of the advanced sailing features uh, in the system. So I am gonna close out of here. And just to show you as an example, I'm gonna go back into my chart app. This is just a standard chart plotter application. And let me open the menu. And I'm gonna go down here again to our settings. Um, and let's see, did we get any changes in here yet? We did not yet. Okay. Um, what I was hoping to see here, and this is probably because I'm in a simulated mode. Well, let me start with this. Notice the icon has changed. I actually have a sailboat icon as opposed to a powerboat icon. Um, on a live system, you would actually see an additional tab pop up in here. Um, and that would be the tab to set up your polars. Um, so we have uh, polar tables uh, built into Lighthouse now for several hundred different popular models of cruising 
and racing sailboats. So you can go in and select your particular hull uh, out of the list of polars. Um, and what the polars do for a sailboater is they give you um, a performance model for that boat and what type of speed it is supposed to be capable of for any given wind speed and wind angle. Um, when we have the polars selected for sailing vessel on here, we can display on, um, on the chart display, we can display ley lines. So they give you optimal angles to sail uh, to the wind. Um, we can show other performance data in the dashboard as well. Um, so kind of like the icon shifted here, um, the sailing features would come to life if we were to go into the data dashboard. And uh, let's see if it's gonna show us any sailing dials. We actually get some sailing specific instrumentation um, that will auto-populate in this dashboard as well. Um, it looks like because I'm running a simulated system, it's not loading everything up that I would hope to show you. But let me do this for you. Um, we are planning another episode uh, down the road, uh, not too far away, probably within the next three weeks. Where we're going to bring back one of our uh, resident experts, Greg Wells, uh, to join us and actually go through in detail all of the sailing features on Axiom. Um, we did a session last spring with Greg. Uh, I encourage you to take a peek at that, but we're going to bring him back uh, and take a fresh uh, look at all of the sailing features on Axiom. But they are in there. Um, without doing a master reset on this simulated system, I can't show you a lot of them uh, right now, unfortunately. Let's see, I think we might have time for one more question. Johnny Cake would like to know, I may have missed it. Can I view any of these charts on a PC? And if so, what software is required? Uh, so Johnny, the Lighthouse charts are brand new. They are not PC viewable yet, uh, but I will emphasize the word yet. Uh, stay tuned, because we will have some news coming on that in the not too distant future. Mark would like to know, on my Axiom 9, the status area popover does not display radar or AIS status, only the time and Bluetooth connections. This has worked before. Is there a simple fix? Heading offshore and no AIS transmit. Okay, Mark, um, let's take a look at that status menu. Um, if we can go back to the product camera, I am gonna bring this Axiom back to its home screen. And the status menu is this guy up here on uh, the right. So we have some um, icons up here. Uh, this is our AIS status. Um, so we can tell whether we are transmitting, receiving, whether we're in silent mode. Um, this is our radar antenna status. So we can tell if we are transmitting or not. We can tell if our sonar is pinging uh, or not. We also have a little hidden menu up, up here as well. Um, so if you are not seeing this bar update, that makes me wonder if something got disconnected on your system, because um, those should populate. Um, you should also be able to, uh, obviously, to see your AIS contacts on your chart and on your radar. And I suspect if that has disappeared, that you're not getting that. Um, those are normally connected via CTOC NG or NEMA 2000. I would double check that you haven't uh, maybe unplugged something. Um, if everything is connected and if you're receiving targets, it's just the bar itself is missing, um, we might have some kind of a weird glitch. Um, one solution to try would be a reset of the unit. Before you reset it, I would back up your waypoints, routes, and settings. That's actually done right here off of the My Data page. Go to My Data, uh, go to Import and Export, and then right here, Save My Data, and just save it all. Um, and when that finishes, do save my settings. And at, either way, it's gonna ask you where you wanna save these. So I have multiple SD cards plugged in on this thing. You just pick one of them that you wanna save to. It'll uh, give you a, a file name and it's gonna save and back up all your data. Once you've backed everything up, that gives you something to restore from because we're, um, we're gonna try blowing the unit out. Let me show you how we do that. I am gonna go back a menu. So I'm gonna go from the home screen here into settings, and we're gonna to go to this display, and I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom, and we have this button here called factory reset. And this is gonna blow your Axiom out so like it's new out of the box. 
So if there is some type of a software glitch or some kind of strange configuration that has disabled that status indicator, that will certainly bring it back, uh, but it is going to wipe out your, uh, your waypoints and routes and other saved information. Um, so after you come full circle from a factory reset, you can go back into that import export menu that is out on the home screen. Um, and you know, right back here, go to my data, import export, and you're gonna do an import from the card. And then whatever SD card you backed it up to, you would click, um, you'll find your file on here. I didn't actually notice where I saved it to. I apologize, I didn't look. It should be here somewhere. Uh, anyway, you would select the file and restore it and that'll give you all your information back. Uh, Bill Martinelli just put a good question up and this is one that uh, I got a couple times recently. So let's pull that one up. It's the bottom one, Mr. Producer. Bill would like to know, how do I have multiple SD cards connected to this system? Uh, let me show you how I am doing that. And there's a couple ways um, that, that we can do this, Bill. So a typical Axiom has uh, one card slot in the back. Um, so on, a, on an Axiom or Axiom Plus, it's a single micro SD card in the back, but they also have on the back of them a, um, a mini uh, or sorry, a micro USB port. It's labeled as accessory, and we do have an accessory that plugs into it, and conveniently, oops, I have one here behind me. Uh, so this is an example of a remote card reader, uh, and I apologize, this one isn't camera ready, but I uh, um, wasn't planning to pull it out, but since you asked, here it is. Uh, so this is a uh, remote card reader. It plugs into that accessory port on Axiom, uh, and this particular one gives you a, um, an SD card slot um, and it has um, a USB connection on it as well. You can use to charge a USB device. This will provide power from Axiom to charge devices. So that would give me two slots on an Axiom. Um, you can go even further than that um, by networking Axioms together. So you could have maps in Axiom A and maps in Axiom B and they are all shared across the network and they're all visible. Um, let's go to, back to the product camera for a second. And because I want to show you, I'm just going to go into my chart menu. And let me open up the menu again. Do it with my mouse so you can see my touches. So I'm going to open up, oops, I touched it twice. Open the menu and I am going to go into my settings. And this first tab called cartography actually shows me all of the map files that are available on my system. So I have here uh, two Axiom 12s uh, side by side. Uh, one of them has a card reader plugged into it. Um, and then one of them actually, one of those SD cards has multiple charts uh, programmed on it. And that's why I have so many charts available on the system. Uh, but I am simultaneously running CMAP. I am running Lighthouse Charts North America. I am running some of the much older uh, Lighthouse Charts. I am running a Strike Lines chart. I am running raster charts for multiple regions of North America. And I have a Navionics Platinum Plus uh, and a Navionics Sonar chart. Um, so it's a lot of data, um, but it is basically spread out across the two built-in card readers uh, and then two uh, external card readers connected to the accessory port. Um, so you can, can definitely load a lot of data onto these things. And then with Lighthouse Charts, you can double up, triple up, and put multiple charts on the same card. Um, so there's a lot uh, to choose from here. Um, and the system does a pretty good job of handling it all, though this is probably kind of extreme what I've got going on here. All right, and uh, that basically has uh, eaten up our hour. Wow, the time goes by very, very fast. So I wanna thank you all for tuning in tonight to take a look at Lighthouse Charts and Lighthouse 314 Fremantle. We will be back again next week with another episode of Raymarine Live, so be sure to tune in Thursday, 7 p.m., both on YouTube and Facebook. If you like what you're doing here, or uh, what we're doing here, what we're all doing here together, uh, please uh, share our broadcast with your friends. Uh, tell the guys at the marina uh, what we're doing here, especially if they're Ray Marine users. We'd love to have them join us. And of course, feel free to drop your questions and comments into the uh, uh, into the box on uh, whatever interface you are watching from. 
because uh, not only do we take questions and comments live, we will continue to take uh, questions and comments uh, on these videos uh, for all eternity, for all intents and purposes. I keep answering the questions if you keep asking. So until next Thursday, please uh, have a wonderful and safe boating weekend. And we will see you then next Thursday, 7 p.m. for Raymarine Live. Thanks for watching. Good night.